everyone, and thank you very much for joining the fourth community conference, where I'll be looking back at COP26, which the UK hosted in Glasgow just over a month ago. As to introduce myself, for those of you who are new to our conference series, my name is Lawrence Abel and I work for Julian and have a background in environmental and quaternary sciences. Joining me today is our wonderful panel who will be providing us with their insights from COP, the challenges we face, and most importantly, the solutions that might be able to, we might be able to employ as a world, as a nation, and as a community. With us, some familiar faces and some new ones, so please give a warm welcome to Richard Craven, who is the Director and Harbour Master of the Tipster Harbour Conservancy, to Cancer Penny Plant, who represents the Harbour Villages Ward and is here in her capacity as the Cabinet Member for Environment at Tipster District Council, Steve Reid, who is the Director of Environment and Public Protection uh, at West Sussex County Council, Abigail Dombe, who is the Chair of Hydrogen Sussex, which is a new body supporting and facilitating the hydrogen economy across Sussex, and Jack Thompson, who is the conservation officer at the RSPB, the UK's largest nature conservation charity. And of course, Gillian Keegan, our Member of Parliament and Minister of State at Department of Health and Social Care, and the person responsible for bringing us all together today. So before we get going, just a bit of housekeeping. All of you should be able to access the Q&A function. Uh, my colleagues and I will be monitoring this to have colleagues who you can't see but are here. Um, and we'll be doing our best to bring your comments and questions in as we discuss things. Um, I do ask you keep them brief and concise and also try and relate it to the topics we're discussing as it makes it easier for me to include them in the debate. Um, we'll be covering quite a large range of topics um, as, it, as uh, was done at COP. So during the opening ceremony, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson set out his key ambitions for COP, which were coal, cars, cash and trees. So we'll be looking at these areas to see how they relate to our local community. In a moment, I'm going to kick things off by asking Gillian to say a few words on what COP was like, because she was lucky enough to attend in person, but before I do, I want to share a quote with you from Sir David Attenborough, who during the opening, who said this during the opening ceremony of the conference, um, as his words are, I think, poignant as we move into our conference. It comes down to this. The people alive now and the generation to come will look at this conference and consider one thing. Did the numbers stop rising and did and start to stop as a result of commitments made here? There is every reason that the answer can be yes. Working apart, we are, we are forces powerful, powerful enough to destabilise our planet. Surely working together, we're powerful enough to save it. Well, I think that's the question we'll be asking ourselves. Was COP26 success? And will this number start stop rising and start to really drop? Gillian, over to you. What was COP like and did we do enough? Uh, thanks very much, Lawrence. Uh, and thanks to the whole panel for giving up your time um, on a Thursday evening and um, to talk about what I know for all of you are hugely important issues. And thank you to all those who have tuned in as well. Um, obviously, we will also be recording it, so it'll be available online for those that want to uh, see it later on. Uh, as you said, I did have the privilege of attending COP26, and it was a unique experience. It was obviously massively busy, uh, attendees from all over the world. It was quite palpable, actually, how much um, the, the, the nations were trying to work together. Um, but, you know, we were actually joining nations of people who face remarkably different futures. You know, some are at risk of extreme weather events and they were really keen to get the financial support to prepare themselves for these eventualities. And they were making a sort of desperate plea um, to get the finances to help them cope and mitigate what they see as an inevitable uh, climate change. And then there were some others who were far more desperate, um, making a desperate plea as they face be it disappear, di disappearing off the face of the earth. You know, they think that their islands may no longer exist. Um, so it was, um, you know, it really did seem to represent uh, the reality, those who are really on the front line of the, the damage that's been done. And obviously also the other nations and major nations which are in the midst of either development um, or trying to find a balance between action on climate and also economic growth. Um, and of course, you know, the, the, there was, you know, obviously India and China where fossil fuels still power the economic progress by and large. Um, so, you know, we had to had to try and balance all of that and bring all of those countries together. So it was like, I've never really been to the United Nations, but it kind of, you know, it, it was the United Nations COP26, you know, it was a, its own place for the event. And, you know, what it is, is incremental rounds of discussions on various events and trying to get the text so that you can get people to agree um, on what are massively big issues. What was clear is, is um, you know, our leadership and our leader, uh, Alok Sharma, was very, very well respected. Obviously, he'd spent the year running up to the presidency, uh, going around and visiting lots of people. 
but it was clear that he was highly respected and he was uh, really quite key to the negotiations. He was running from place to place trying to bring things together. If they were looking like they were going a bit off track, then he'd be, trying, he'd be sent in to, uh, to try and, and make sure that they were put back on track. Um, so the UK has been leading the world in the fight against climate change. Um, you know, we were the first major economy to commit to become net zero by 2050 and to reduce our emissions by over two thirds by 2030. So also having that near term target. And we are well on the way to doing that. Uh, we've reduced our emissions by a quarter since uh, 2010. And we've done that by rapidly upscaling renewables, in particular, um, you know, solar panels, 99% of all the solar panels that we have, uh, have been put in place uh, since 2010. And in fact, Keith in our office had his put in in Tangmere today. He sent us a picture uh, where we could see his, uh, his new solar panels. Plus, of course, the UK has developed the world's largest offshore wind capacity, which we plan to quadruple. So we have a 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution, and this is seen as world leading. And COP26 was a great opportunity for us to share the exciting steps that were taken and emphasising that growth and economic development can be enhanced through positive environmental action and, and not hindered. So I think COP26, um, you know, it was a bit of a mixed bag, obviously, because we had uh, some of those changes towards the end. But in general, it was a, it was a big success in making some inroads on the key areas uh, which we set out to achieve. And most importantly, the Glasgow Pact, which is keeping alive the goal of 1.5 degrees. Uh, so the pact is the first time ever that every country signed up to phase down unabated coal consumption and also committed to raising 100 billion pounds annually, uh, dollars, sorry, annually for climate finance through to 2025. So on coal, 65 countries have now committed to phasing out the use of coal power, plus all major coal financing countries are committed to end international coal finance by the end of 2021, with 20 billion pounds uh, dollars uh, in funding to support the transition to clean power. So that was a positive move. On cash, uh, a COP26, more public and private finance was mobilised to support climate action in developing countries than ever before. And I am encouraged that the global financial system is aligning behind a net zero world. New pledges were made at COP um, to bring develop, developing countries, developed countries closer to meeting the $100 billion annual climate finance target. Uh, we're not quite there, but uh, we will be continuing to mobilise billions in private finance and green investment, and we will continue on until we meet that target. On cars, uh, countries work together to build a consensus on cars and specifically electric vehicles. Over 30 countries and some of the world's largest car makers committed to work together to make all new car sales uh, zero emission globally by 2040 and by 2035 in some of those leading markets, uh, building on the UK's commitment to end the sale of all new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. So that's quite a considerable commitment from many more countries around the world. On trees, more than 130 leaders representing over 90% of the world's forests pledged to end deforestation by 2030. And that was backed by almost 14 billion pounds of public and private funding. So these are the top four priority areas and there was some of the progress that was made at the meeting. Uh, there were also some other significant announcements, including the Global Methane Pledge, um, as methane is the second largest contributor to global warming after carbon, and it can warm the atmosphere 80 times as fast as, as carbon dioxide. Cutting methane emissions is vital to tackling uh, climate change and reaching net zero. So the pledge there was to reduce methane emissions by 30% by 2030. And this pledge was signed by 105 countries covering half of the top 30 big methane emitters around the world. So this equates to a potential of 0.2 uh, degrees uh, warming by 2050 that could be avoided, uh, which will play a critical role in keeping 1.5 within reach. Um, so to me, the, the real success of COP, though, was that it felt like w there was a tipping point in terms of every country really um, getting on board uh, before we took the presidency of COP26. 
um, just 30% of the world was covered by a net zero commitment. And today that figure exceeds 90%. So whether we like the commitments, whether we think it's fast enough, whether we'd like people to go faster, the reality is we now have 90% um, of uh, those uh, countries around the world making commitments to net zero, which I think is really what we will be celebrating uh, out of COP. But of course, the work will continue and, um, you know, there's, there's, there's so much to do, uh, but I think it was uh, seen as a very successful movement. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Janine. And hopefully everyone can hear me better now. I've got a headset on. Uh, there were a few complaints about noise and sound quality, so hopefully they have improved. Um, so with that, I think we'll uh, we'll kick off with coal because coal is the single biggest contributor to climate change, still is, um, despite the UK's ambitions and the um, the uh, the way to fix that seems to be renewable energy. So in, uh, with that in mind, uh, can I um, pass the uh, baton, as it were, to Abigail, who is from Hydrogen Sussex, to talk a bit about renewable energy and what she's doing. Yes, um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here tonight. It's um, a real pleasure to be involved. Um, I mean, I think we've seen we've seen in the UK um, over the last 10 years, our coal consumption, we used to use a, a huge amount of coal um, for to generate our electricity. And um, actually over the last 30 years, that has gone down from probably 30% of our electricity was generated from coal to it's literally um, around one or two percent and we're going to be we have a deadline to completely phase out coal in the next couple of years and I think what we've what we've achieved in the UK is brilliant it's absolutely tremendous and it's it's one of the one of the huge success stories for the UK in terms of our progress um, in decarbonizing our society um, and one of the most impressive um, decarbonization stories worldwide um, other countries are starting to follow suit. And ironically, that's part of the reason for the increase in gas prices that we're all experiencing at the moment. It's not the, the, the only reason, but um, China is shifting a lot um, from it, coal consumption onto gas consumption, which is why there's suddenly an increased demand in, in, in the prices. Um, a lot of the, so yes, a lot of the countries are, are starting to shift away from coal. Um, and I think we need to absolutely maintain pressure on that. And we also do need to look at whether the coal mines, um, the coal mine is needed in, in the UK. Um, the coal mine that was uh, approved in Cumbria was specifically for um, manufacturing steel, um, but there are now other, um, other energy uses that can be used to, to, to create um, green steel, um, including using hydrogen. To produce green steel, so um, it's um, there are other alternatives out there. I think it's um, it, it's a case of society and industry need to transform at such incredible pace that we need to actually be more agile than we have been in looking at what possibilities are out there, what renewables are out there, and what we can use. I think, and that and that's the challenge for us all. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Abigail. And obviously, hydrogen is a relatively new um, new technology and the infrastructure may not necessarily be there. Can you talk about a little bit how we can actually use hydrogen in our in our kind of modern systems and, and any opportunities that you see for, for Sussex as an area? Yes, apologies. I haven't really explained that. So um, so I'm chair of um, Hydrogen Sussex and um, hydrogen is basically it's the, the new net zero fuel. Um, it's a it's a form of energy that we can produce without giving off any carbon. Um, we can, um, the, the cleanest way to produce it is um, electrolysis where you pass electricity through water and you produce hydrogen and oxygen. And once you've got this hydrogen, you can then, you can either combust it with oxygen and um, in the same way that you can combust gas at the moment. So you can pr produce very high temperatures, which are used for um, essential for some industrial processes so you can combust this hydrogen and it, again it won't give off any um, CO2 or you can also pass it through a fuel cell which um, is brilliant science and basically you pass it through this piece of kit and you produce energy you produce electricity and so there are um, hydrogen fuel cell heavy vehicles um, 
can, will be increasingly um, increasingly used, um, increasingly popular. Hydrogen fuel cell will produce um, will be the solution for um, the maritime sector and for aviation. So there are there are so many sectors that will need to um, decarbonize at at speed over the next um, ten years, basically. Um, and hydrogen will be the solution for, for many of these sectors. And also there are areas such as um, producing fertilizer. Fertilizers is uh, absolutely essential for all our non-organic farms who use chemical fertilizers. And the, the basic um, ingredient for these fertilizers is ammonia, which comes from hydrogen. So hydrogen will be key. And it, it, um, the Committee for Climate Change believe that it's one of the very, very key um, elements for um, decarbonizing, decarbonizing our society. And um, sorry, go on. No, sorry. I just wanted to bring in what Steve Smith said. He said he said that 20 years ago. Oh, sorry. In 1969, uh, hydrogen was the industry that was 20 years away. Yes. Is what he he said when he was at UD. But obviously, it's taken a little bit longer. Is there a particular reason why we've struggled to kind of utilize hydrogen properly, despite it being, as he said, the the, the energy of the future, the near future, even back then? Yeah, I think I mean there are there are a number of things like that. There's a uh, nuclear fission, which is a uh, you know that's the energy of the future. That's only that's been just around the corner for the last fifty years or so. And I think um, there are some um, you know I think there's 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 reason for some cynicism that there are a number of technologies that have been just around the corner for a period of time, but um, it's changed from um, the the, the um, Technology has has part, has improved so much over the last 20, 30 years that we now have. It's not just theoretical. We have. Um, I was listening to a podcast yesterday about how there are hydrogen trucks all over China delivering Budweiser, as Budweiser is um, beer is heavy, so um, you need um, it's a heavy weight. You need large trucks for it, powerful trucks, and so there are hydrogen fuel cell trucks and Budweisers now. Um, actually got a plant in Wales where they'll be producing their own hydrogen for their trucks and also for their brewing process. So um, it's turned from being um, it's turned from being just around the corner or 10 or 20 years away to being I think it will be the and the fuel or the energy vector to be more precise of the 2020s and um, yeah, if you if you follow what's going on in hydrogen it's just there's more and more news around it there's there's Scottish uh, Scottish breweries, um, Scottish distilleries are working in hydrogen. I'm working with a company, um, uh, manufacturing company in Sussex, that are looking at trialing hydrogen in their production facility. So there's there's huge amounts of go huge amounts going on in hydrogen uh, across across Sussex, across the country, and uh, across the world actually at the moment. It's Julia, um, you... the hydrogen Enapta, which is a um, the company that produces these uh, electrolyzers, which are used to produce to make green hydrogen, they won the uh, the Earthshot Prize. Um, that was um, Prince William was championing just last month. So yeah, it, hydrogen is the fuel of now. It's not twenty years away anymore. It is the fuel of today. Well, that's all very exciting. And uh, Gillian, you had your hand up. You wanted to come in. Yeah. I I was going to say that at uh, COP26, I actually uh, got to see the world's first hydrogen ambulance as well. Yeah. Uh, that's capable of traveling up to 300 miles before recharging. And that was developed here in this country. And there was an awful lot of interest in that uh, as well. So I think uh, these hydrogen hydrogen vehicles and certainly for, for as, as uh, Abigail said, to some of the sort of heavier vehicles, um, it, it, it seems there is an awful lot of activity in this area and there's a lot of uh, proof now that this technology uh, is working. Yes, absolutely. We're, we're going to get our first hydrogen fuel cell buses in the region um, next summer. I was about um, to say, not to put Steve on the spot, but Steve, Wessex County Council buses, that's that's ringing my ears. What, have you, anything you can give us, any, any, any snippets? Are we going to get hydrogen buses rolling around the county soon? Well, I can't promise it's going to be any time soon, uh, Lawrence, but it's certainly something that we're engaging with the suppliers of transport. Uh, you know, we I think we move something like 7000 uh, school children a day to to school through uh, transport contracts. And we're taking a close look at that to say, how can we start decarbonizing 
uh, the way that we're 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 moving uh, kids around. So uh, we're certainly talking to some of the local bus companies, and uh, some of those are very very interested in hydrogen. Others see electric vehicles as the way to go, and there's probably a, a cutoff somewhere there in relation to the size of the vehicles. The heavier vehicles will probably ultimately go down the hydrogen route, and and lighter vehicles probably for the time being. Um, it, it, electric propulsion is probably going to be the, the way that they will uh, they will go. But it's kind of reflective of um, the same conversations we're having in in other parts of what we do. So. We move waste around the county and indeed uh, uh, Councillor Penny Plant there from Chichester, Chichester District Council are looking at their uh, refuse collection vehicles and uh, very seriously interested in electric propulsion for that. When you get to very heavy goods vehicles, then as I say, in due course, hydrogen is probably the way to go. So yeah, there's uh, a lot of things happening. It's just an illustration of how we're working with the people that supply services to us to look at how we decarbonize uh, moving people and uh, things around the county. Well, I feel like we're moving very swiftly on to our second um, air element of cars, um, which we will we'll go to. We might have to dip back into some more renewable energy later because I, I don't want to miss out on some of the other renewables going on locally. But whilst we're there, road emissions do account for 70 percent of the UK's of, of, of our emissions. Um, sorry, road transport accounts for 70 percent of the UK's global emissions. So um, whilst we're on that. Um, Penny, your contract services comes under your brief in uh, CDC. Could you talk a little bit about what you're doing um, on, on that vein? Uh, are you asking me a question about... Uh, electric vehicles. Electric vehicles rather than quality of air. Uh, yeah, electric vehicles. We, we uh, have, uh, I think it's 33 really big vehicles for collecting uh, refuse. And through a 10-year programme, they obviously all get to the end of their life. So... Um, we are replacing two of them with from diesel to electric. Uh, basically, because at the moment we can't charge any more in at our depots. So if we had more, we might be uh, charging more. Um, we have agreed to buy them, but we haven't yet bought them because actually we're still investigating uh, where is going to be the best supplier. But actually we're quite excited about these electric vehicles because everybody's going to be uh, having a good look. Uh, we took the advice of the Energy Savings Trust as to which um, energy source to use. So we did look at hydrogen, but they said just for the moment, go with electric because hydrogen will catch up. Um, but yeah, there is a market in electric vehicles which we can proce process now. And there is actually there's quite a significant uplift from diesel to electric, but we're, we're, we're going to have a, we're going to have a go and see what it's like. Abigail, you've got your hand up. Yes, um, I mean, I could, I could be very sad and, and go on about this forever and like, <laughs> rely on you, Lawrence, to, to tell me to, uh, to, to shut up, but probably more politely than that. Um, I mean, I think, I think it will be a case of looking at the requirements for each vehicle. Rather, there won't be a one-size-fits-all solution, um, certainly not at the moment. Um, I know that Brighton and Hove buses and Metro bus have been very, very interested in hydrogen for the last five years, and, and they're the ones who will be um, introducing a fleet of 20 hydrogen fuel cell buses on, on the roads in Crawley um, in June or July 22. Um, they, they've gone for hydrogen just because the demands of their buses, their buses have such extensive routes um, and travel for such long um, running cycles every day that they would need to be re recharged twice a day and they just don't have the electrical supply to to be able to do that and sometimes it's 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 not even something that you can buy in if, if the UK electrical network the power UK power network can't doesn't have that supply in the area doesn't have enough electrical capacity then you're completely constrained you can't introduce that so we're having to obviously um, over this decade, we're going to have to electrify absolutely as much as ever, as much as we can, and the grid will have to in, improve. And um, uh, well, speaking of the grid, Abigail, can I just jump yeah. in with a question yeah. from Andy Tomlinson, who said in the chat, "How about the infrastructure for hydrogen refueling? Um, how far away from it being a kind of frequent site on our streets?" That that's a really good question. I th I think that um, with 
with vehicles generally we are going to have to with with a lot of things actually as we as we move into a net zero economy we our behavior our our behavior patterns are going to have to change and so we're not going to automatically all change or replace our petrol or diesel vehicles with electric vehicles we um we can look at having our neighborhood car share schemes um i went to a brilliant webinar yesterday actually on how we can all set up you know real neighborhood car share schemes where people in one street have 10 cars between 50 households and things so and we we can look at having um um ev uh, e-bikes have become so much more popular and, and made commuting distance up to 10 15 miles really really achievable with e-bikes so we're gonna there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to be changing so if you do have uh, uh an electric vehicle you might find that actually you you'll recharge it at home and you virtually never apart from when you're doing long distance driving you'll never go to a garage whereas at the moment you know we only obviously recharge our, our vehicles at garage i th personally think and i quite often um argue with many people on twitter about this uh, with other um, people working in the hydrogen space i think there are areas that hydrogen is the perfect solution for i think there's areas where hydrogen is a very good solution for and i think areas where hydrogen doesn't actually make a huge amount of sense and I have to say that for passenger vehicles, there isn't that much justification for hydrogen. It does take more electricity to produce hydrogen in the first place. So you're better off with a battery electric, a battery electric vehicle. So that will um, neatly move us on then to, to more yeah. of an EV standpoint. Because obviously the government has uh, similar problems with, uh, with the network of charging points there. But the government have committed 1.3 billion to accelerate the rollout of the charging infrastructure across the UK over the next four years. Um, and there are incentives, obviously, for people to purchase um, electric vehicles. Um, Steve, you've, you've, you've been doing some work on EVs um, with the council. Yeah, indeed. We've uh, just recently signed a contract to, uh, with a private sector provider to install uh, EV charge points right across the county, working in partnership with our district and borough uh, colleagues and the the beauty of this particular scheme is that um, as local authorities we have access to a lot of land and obviously as the highways authority the county council has uh, the ability to uh, determine what goes on the highway or alongside the highway and so we will work with the private sector provider they will invest in the uh, the charge points and recoup their costs through the sale of electricity at those charge points but one thing we've been really really uh, stressing is that we need to be putting charge points at places which are accessible to uh, right across uh, the the uh, the county in places that currently uh, are not well served by charge points and it's all very well those of us that have uh, uh, drives and places to park as uh, Abigail says that we can park and recharge at home of course a lot of people don't have that opportunity and therefore it's harder for them to switch to uh, to EV so we will be looking at how we can uh, roll out uh, those facilities across the county and one thing that's really important to say and people be interested in this if you've got a suggestion of where you'd like to see an ev charge point you can go onto the county council's website and find your way through there to um, a page where we have details of that and you can actually say i think it would be a good idea to put a charge point there it doesn't mean to say what we can necessarily facilitate that but we really will do everything we can to uh, uh, to assist that along the way i think there was a general point made in the chat around um well just simply substituting uh, electric or hydrogen vehicles for all the other vehicles on the road is not necessarily what just the thing we should be doing and of course um, uh, uh, through local authorities across the the county the county council and the districts of boroughs we we do work together to uh, to promote cycling to promote walking uh, the amount of infrastructure for cycling is uh, improving across the county council of course we'd like to do more I'm a cyclist myself um, but you know we have a program to do that and that is going to continue uh, going into the future so uh, this is not just about out saying oh that's fine we'll substitute one form of transport for another we need to uh, uh to, to find ways to uh through planning and through uh the way that we uh, use roads to try and discourage uh, vehicle, uh 
car transport and put people onto public transport. But we all know that is not necessarily an easy thing to do. And we have to use a range of measures to encourage people to do that. Um, uh, but, um, you know, with, with that, that's the that's the direction of travel. Uh, we will be electrifying mobility as we need it. And we will be trying to uh, discourage people from using cars for, for every journey where that is uh, where that is absolutely not necessarily needed. Absolutely. But obviously, I'm sure you'll understand that with the rural areas such as the Chichester district and in the county as a whole, uh, personal vehicles are probably more important for, for us maybe than the city goers who can have carpools. So, Gillian, can you just sort of give us a bit of background as to what the government's doing um, to incentivise or, or to support people to, to, to make the transition to an electric vehicle? Because it is an expensive uh, choice in some cases. Yeah, well, there, there's been a plug-in vehicle grant scheme. It's, it's been in place for about a decade now, and uh, the government's invested over £1.5 billion uh, since 2010, supporting nearly half a million vehicles. But that's, you know, what governments do is they seed these things to start to get them going, as well as obviously set the big policy incentives, such as you won't be able to buy any new cars uh, with petrol and diesel after 2030. Uh, but the market is now moving at pace. Um, so we have 150,000 zero emission cars sold so far this year. So what we're doing is we're extending um, the plug-in car grant, but we're changing the structure of it to make it, um, well, a lower amount of money, but to go across a, a, for cheaper cars. So it'll get, go, go across and incentivize um, a larger number of people. Obviously the price of electric vehicles uh, continues to, to go down and has actually reduced over that last 10 years. So, um, it, you know, at an individual perspective, there will still be a, a plug-in car grant that's been extended to 23, um, 20, uh, 22, 23. And then there's also specific uh, plug-in grant for vans, taxis and motorcycles, uh, which is effectively, uh, uh, you know, to try and en enable, again, the market for electric um, vans, taxis and motorcycles. Well, there are electric uh, vans, taxis and motorcycles, but to try and boost that market as well. Thank you very much, Gillian. I'm just trying to pull out some of the uh, comments in the um, in the chat that's coming through. Um, so just quickly, Penny, will you just give a quick roundup as well what the council are doing to increase e EV charging points? Because we've had a few comments about the infrastructure um, locally. What, 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 have, what has the district council done to, to improve the, the access points for those who don't have driveways and garages? Uh, right, yes, this is uh, interesting hearing what uh, Steve is saying, because obviously we're, we're working uh, directly with him and trying to find it, trying to sort of fit into their scheme. Uh, so Chits, the district, I, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but we were off the blocks um, before all the district, before all the other districts in boroughs. Uh, so we took a um, low emission grant um, about five years ago and installed uh, 18 uh, EVs in our car parks uh, and at that time there weren't that many electric vehicles so now the number is coming up uh, they're getting used more but it's still quite low um, so we it's a bit like um, bit, the Betamax discussion like which way which direction do we go in so obviously people don't really want to spend hour, hours uh, waiting for their car to charge um, so in Chichester I just now Steve is here, that in the south of the city, there are very, there are no car parks in the south of Chichester, and there are lots of people that live in flats. And so if they've all got an electric car, how are they going to, are they going to take it in turns overnight to charge their car? Because the, the low uh, power ratings are very slow, and most people are used to going to a petrol station, filling up in five minutes and going home. So there's going to be, there's definitely going to be a, a culture change there. Uh, so basically, we wait and see. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how quickly the market takes up the electric car, whether they get out of them and go cycling, or how basically how long they're willing to wait uh, to charge their car if they don't have access to one near their near their house. And we certainly don't want cables trading all over the pavement. That's that, that's absolutely the worst scenario. So I'll just leave it at there, and we'll wait and see what happens. Fantastic. Um, thank you. I think I think what we'll do is is, is I, I would quite like to go back uh, to our kind of over the coal section. We're talking about renewable energy because I feel we've we only covered hydrogen as as a 
as a renewable energy source. And I think there's there's some others, especially for RA, that are quite important, um, namely uh, with um, wind power. Um, and I know Jack, who's from the RSPB, has been involved in the Rampion 2 project. Um, so, Jack, would you just sort of give us a bit of an update on what, you're, what you've been doing on that project and, and uh, yeah, give us a bit of a rundown? Yeah, no problem at all. So, um, uh, essentially, from an RSPB uh, RSPB perspective, um, you know, harnessing offshore renewable energy through wind farms, and then also, you know, the other sorts of energy um, that we can generate through that other scheme. So, you know, looking at wave tidal devices, etc., can be really extremely important uh, contribution to the carbon-free energy system. And we need that in the UK um, if we're able to combat the effects of climate change. But we need to make sure that that's not at any cost um, and certainly not at any cost of damage to our, our fantastic natural marine environment. Um, so from a bird's perspective, um, wind farms can harm birds uh, in three possible ways, and that's through uh, disturbance, habitat loss and also collision from the, um, uh, the, the wind farm arrays themselves as well. So the, uh, the RSPB is part of um, what we call the expert topic group for uh, Rampion 2 uh, for the development of that. And um, what, what we're currently doing is, um, is advising the Rampion uh, Wind Energy um, organization on, uh, on their evidence gathering and monitoring, um, which form a crucial part of the process for wind farm development. And um, right now, the evidence gathering process on collision risk modelling and also sort of, you know, the specific locations for the proposed onshore cable route haven't been fully identified yet. So um, we currently at this point um, can't ascertain exactly what the full impacts might be. Um, but once we have this information available, you know, we'll be able to form our, um, our own position on the, on the likely, uh, likely impacts. You know, I mean, looking more holistically at a UK level as well, you know, we're very much aware of the, uh, of the lack of knowledge and understanding of the full impacts of wind energy so any you know any operations approved for wind farms need to be monitored for the long term as well with policies and practices that are adaptable to to when we learn more about these uh, these impacts and you know overall if we're you know wanting to uh to tackle the uh the climate crisis we need to look at both um you know uh looking at renewable energies but also um, looking at you know nature-based solutions as well and, and how we can kind of tackle that through enhancement of biodiversity and the wider environment. Absolutely and obviously uh, uh, the UK government is uh, in planning to quadruple the UK's offshore wind capability um, as part of their 10 point green industrial um, 10 point plan for their green industrial revolution. Um, and already with the UK has the largest uh, offshore wind capacity in the world. So can I just throw it out to the panel, maybe um, Steve, as you're involved in, in sort of the renewable world with your role at uh, the County Council, your, your thoughts on wind? I think, well, the County Council itself doesn't have any wind facilities. We've gone, uh, we've invested quite a bit in solar, which we'll no doubt we'll come back to that uh, later, Please. Lawrence. But um, but solar is, uh, sorry, that wind is, is, is going to be a massive part of uh, decarbonising our electric supply. And uh, at the moment, if you look at the Rampion um, uh, offshore wind uh, farm, it's providing about... I think 1% of uh, what's required in, in the government's energy strategy for uh, it, it overall capacity for, for wind. So uh, we're going to need, if we're going to go down that route, we're going to need uh, Rampion 2 and no doubt many other uh, facilities around around the coast. But um, uh, as far as the, the, the county council is concerned, as I say, we're, we're uh, big on uh, solar and we have two... Uh, uh, solar uh, farms and we have basically the equivalent of a third one on the roofs of uh, our buildings right across the county so uh, in total we actually generate more electricity than we consume uh, within all of our our, our estate and uh, it's a it, it's it's the something that we can do as householders it's something that small businesses can do it's something that public uh, sector bodies can be doing because it's uh, it's it's relatively low impact technology which can help with uh, resilience fantastic and um obviously wind 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 going back to wind is quite important for um the hydrogen network abigail um is there anything because there's there's obviously as you said before it takes more energy to make the hydrogen 
um, than it does to, to, to than it produces when you burn it off. So obviously there's the difference between green hydrogen, um, which is obviously the popular version, um, or the alternative, which is which is actually probably you know net damaging. Um, how important is 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 the, is is offshore wind to hydrogen production and usage in the UK? Um, so just to be clear for those who um, aren't completely immersed in the hydrogen sphere as, as I am. So at the moment, um, the 97% of the hydrogen that's used in the UK and probably worldwide is um, hydrogen derived from fossil fuels and um, which generates CO2, um, which isn't caught. So it is a polluting form of hydrogen and it's used in all sorts of different sectors. Um, predominantly manufacturing sectors. Um, so the new, the two forms of hydrogen that are mainly going to be focused on are um, hydrogen that's produced from renewables or from nuclear power. Um, and it's produced by passing electricity through water, as I mentioned before. So it's, it's, uh, it's known as electrolytic hydrogen. So it's, it doesn't come from fossil fuels. And it is, depending on where the electricity comes from, but it can be completely zero carbon. Um, and the other form of hydrogen is blue hydrogen, which is comes from fossil fuels. Um, but the um, the carbon that's given off from, from the fossil fuels is is captured um, and stored so that the carbon isn't isn't released into the atmosphere. And that is still very low carbon hydrogen. And the, and, um, the government are actually currently um, consulting on on their standard for um, low carbon hydrogen to make sure that we aren't just going yeah that's low carbon hydrogen and, and not been not been rigorous and whether it is um, still um, giving off greenhouse gases or not. So um, the question was uh, if <laughs> you'd quite like me to answer the question, wouldn't you, Lawrence? So the, que the question was about um, renewables. Um, on a, I mean I'm. I, I live in Brighton, um, I'm from Brighton, and I, I have to say, I love to see Rampion um, out at sea. Um, and I'm really proud to see it and, and see that, um, I hadn't realized until I went on a boat trip out there with um, a, um, RWE who are um, behind the, the project, um, that it is by far the biggest, it's the most made, it's the, the only really significant um, wind farm in, in the English Channel. So there, there, are, there are lots of wind farms in the North Sea and there's wind farms um, in the Atlantic around Scotland, but the, the, this is the major wind farm in the English Channel. And we, we desperately need Rampion too. We desperately need more and more um, wind power beca because we will need to replace the, the, the gas that's, that's um, used to generate electricity we we need to stop using gas to generate electricity and so we need to have huge we need to have colossal amounts of renewables um, at the moment i think uh we've as i said we've hugely decarbonized electricity but we're not there yet um, the plan is to completely decarbonize it by 2035 um, but at the moment, but already Scotland is, their electricity is virtually completely decarbonised. I think it's about 99% is from renewables and nuclear. Because they obviously have, they have a huge amount of um, coastline and um, a not particularly dense population. So they're not actually, they don't have the same electricity demands. And because of this, because our grid is older, as I mentioned earlier, we can't easily put in a huge amount of power into the grid in Scotland and draw on that power in London or in Chichester or in Brighton. It doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't trickle all the way through the grid like that. So it makes sense to produce, to have um, huge hydrogen production facilities in Scotland where we have excess, um, excess renewables going into the grid and then we can produce more. Um, we don't have quite that possibility here, but we, but we also have a lot of areas which are gonna start really needing hydrogen such as the maritime sector. So we're looking at much smaller, more localized hydrogen production, which will be um, in, because we don't, we're not awash in um, gas um, pipelines in Sussex, going across Sussex. So we're, we're very much looking at green hydrogen, electrolytic hydrogen. So we'd be looking at much smaller hydrogen production facilities um, based on local 
renewable supplies. So, so Shore and Port is looking at producing its own hydrogen, predominantly from its own renewable supply in Shoreham. And, you know, I think it probably would be worthwhile me having a chat with um, our colleagues at West Sussex County Council about whether there's any potential for a hydrogen production facility attached to their some of their um, PV plants, because there are more and more organisations who are interested in, um, in investing in these production facilities. I hope that answers that answers your question. It does, and I can see Steve nodding over there. Excellent, that's what I want to hear. <laughs> Um, the one thing you did mention interesting about Scotland was was the um, the sort of the the low density of the area in population terms. And obviously, Richard, you 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 represent the Chichester Harbour Conservancy, which is one of those one of those areas where you're mixing the natural world and human beings in, a, in, in an incredibly intense situation um, for everyone. Um, and also, you're a keen environmentalist, I know. So, do you want to kind of pick like where you haven't spoken? Do you want to come in on, on renewables generally and what it's like to try and input those in an area where there there is a, a vast amount of nature and humanity all kind of piling in? You're on mute, by the way. Thanks, Lawrence. Yeah, obviously, and um, critically important that we sort of de de decarbonize. You know, we've all seen you know, the huge. Um, increase in carbon in the atmosphere over the last 30 years. I think it's almost doubled since 1989. So, so we need to grasp these opportunities where, wherever we can. But also you need some, some areas which are very special for wildlife and, and they, we, they need to put, be put first in, in those circumstances. And uh, so, so, so wind uh, turbines around Chester Harbour is probably not going to be a, a great idea as, uh, as, as Jack point, pointed out, but, but no, fully support them offshore in, in, in the right, in the right places. And I saw in the chat uh, reference to um, hydroelectric. You know, we, we'd we'd like to see see that as well. Um, we have we have tried um, helping some development some of these in the harbour. You know, we have found though that uh, the tidal flows were so great that they uh, didn't tend to to last last the course. But you no, know, yeah, it's hugely important that we we we, um, we move forward with. Uh, renewables and we're getting the best of both worlds the oversupply over supply with really windy periods when you can tap into the uh, the, the green hydrogen um and obviously we, we know we need other things to to pick up that that period where you haven't got wind you haven't got sun so you know hydrogen or, or no, dare i say it we're going to have to rely on nuclear at, at some stage as well just to um to, to keep that that uh, that that supply going but you know, you know above all you know we need to keep that that carbon down fantastic thank you so much um and one of the one of the interesting things um that came up um i think we'll move on sorry from renewables now because um i feel i feel like we should we should be covering the other elements of cop 26 um and one of the things that uh Gillian mentioned earlier was the ambulance the electric the uh, hydroelectric ambulance that came up um and many of you well as Gillian mentioned she actually spoke at uh, at COP26 on behalf of the government on their health day um where we learned some interesting uh things about the global health system including its um uh, uh, net emissions into the world and it, it, she said in her speech that if it was a country it would be the fifth largest emitter um, and also the increasing complexities of health conditions that are arising because of climate change so at this point I think it'd be just interesting if we can as Gillian was there and spoke on this if we can have the kind of the specs from the health the health uh, sector Gillian. Uh, thanks well there's two there's two main things the first is which I think actually did come as a surprise to a lot of people was just how uh, big a footprint, a carbon footprint, our health systems are responsible for. Um, so one of the things that was a um, key piece of work leading up to the, to the conference was uh, to make sure that 50 nations from all across the world uh, have made pledges uh, to develop low carbon sustainable health systems on the path towards uh, net zero and to develop national strategies to make health systems more resilient to climate change and that's particularly uh, in some of those areas well I mean the US as well was included in this where they uh, do have quite a lot of extreme weather events and how we can make the health systems more resilient to um, climate change I mean obviously everyone it was against the backdrop of the pandemic so everybody as health as and the health systems have gone up in terms of um, uh, concern I guess but also um, 
uh, appreciation of how of how important they are and how, uh, but also because sometimes how fragile they are. What would you do if your you know your health system was your hospitals weren't there or whatever uh, because of an extreme weather event? So that that was that was another um, part of it. And then and then it was about the people that the health services um, support. You know, health systems around the world, and particularly in certain countries, are already seeing the impact of climate change on the front line, on their population, on people who come in, uh, whether that's due to natural disasters or air quality or water in insecurity, um, crop production and, and the, the, the impact that has on uh, people and people's health. So representatives from um, over 100 nations, making up all over three quarters of the world's health professionals have signed uh, the healthy climate prescription so I was there and able to take um, take um, delivery of that uh, prescription which is basically the health professionals around the world saying we need to do more to address uh, the, the, the climate crisis you know we need to take action as I say from 100 nations around the world so you know there was a lot of talk and I think this is where as well um, you know there's the, another thing that our colleague um, uh, Andrew Griffiths, who was the net zero business um, um, champion for COP26, you know, going around and talking to businesses and saying, OK, what, what, what's your remission? What do you do? How can you make a pledge yourself? And that's been very successful. People are taking more responsibility. Businesses are, are, are taking more responsibility. And, you know, I, I'm sure George will come up and say it's greenwashing in a minute. But, you know, you have to basically start with with that sort of call to action and then you have to shine a light on individual things like through a health system lens or through a particular industry lens and then of course you create the the conditions and the competition to make sure that everybody is really focused on um, making sure that they do everything they can from the perspective of their part of the of the value chain to reduce um, net zero. So all, um, you know, all of that was being discussed. We, we've been doing some interesting things. Again, this, these are things that you start doing and then look at how you can scale them. But we've been partnering with some countries in the Caribbean to support um, smart hospitals that are more resilient to extreme weather events and uh, obviously use um, green technologies similar to what West Sussex are doing, uh, solar panels, etc. So there's a lot of work that we can do. Um, and that partnering across that health community was something that we saw for the first time, I think, at COP26. Um, in terms of the UK, um, you know, we've all four of, of the health services have pledged to, you know, to cut emissions, build back greener and uh, decarbonise uh, the NHS. Um, so that was that was another thing. And then the last part of the announcements that was there on, on health, uh, it, it was really um, the investment in, in, in funding some research as well. So the National Institute for Health Research, so that was at the UK level, is developing um, a, a package of funding for research to develop new uh, evidence. Um, and that's focused on improving health outcomes of those most impacted by climate change in developing countries so what's the evidence what works most there's a, a, and you see it in in the chat and you see it in every one of these conversations there's a whole load of competing ideas there's always also people who you know have got different views about what really is the most effective etc but in some cases we need to uh, you know better get the evidence so that we can make sure we do the right thing it always sobers me and I'm always very, um, always reminded of when in this country, um, many years ago under, under previous administration, um, we thought it was a good idea for everybody to move to diesel cars to help the, uh, to help the climate, um, you know, and, and we got that completely wrong, obviously. And there's been some other uh, examples of that. So the evidence based of uh, focusing on for those developing countries, what are the interventions that are most going to help and funding the research so that we can make sure that the climate finance is also um, well um, targeted as well. Thank you very much, uh, Gillian. And actually, and um, we've had a few comments in the chat as we've gone on about, about island nations just disappearing um, with increased sea level rises. Um, and a big part of the way that COP addressed that was actually through the cash element of um, 
those four subjects. And I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on the cash element, but I think it would be worth maybe just going through some of the some of the key um, uh, incentives, because obviously the government's committed to, or the sorry, COP wanted to reach a um, hundred um, billion dollars per year in climate finance, um, and we're on our way to doing that. Um, in fact, more public and private finance um, was mobilised during um, COP than ever before to help developing nations, as Gillian said in her introduction. Um, and these include uh, these include things like adaptation plans, which are to help prepare countries that are likely to um, either be totally inundated um, or partially inundated or or indeed have be a greater risk of um, extreme weather events um, as the scientific community now um, is all pretty unanimous things that hurricanes and typhoons will be more frequent and more severe um, with a warming world um, and there, there, there we can put more detail about um, some of those funding um, amounts and um, but the adaptation fund for example um, which the UK um, contributed to or by 20 million dollars for example um, which collectively is a 230 million um, fund but I think we can we can talk we can talk about those and add those onto the onto the website on this page um, after the conference um, along with some of the questions you are putting in the chat that maybe we can't get to um, today um, so with that, I'm quite aware that a lot of people have a high amount of interest from emails that came before this conference on nature-based solutions, um, the natural world, and of course, our final topic of trees. And we have got, we're about halfway through our conference today. So what we'll do now is if we can go and look at uh, firstly trees um, and then uh, some nature-based solutions, we'll bring it back down to the local level. because obviously we've got Jack and Richard here who both represent our kind of key coastal um, areas of um, protection. Um, so I think I think if we just start with some of the some of the nature, like what would be really interesting actually, if we if we if, if Richard, you could start by just kind of giving your kind of thoughts opinions on COP. Like you know, what do you think um, some of the highlights were for you in the in the nature sphere? Um, <laughs> highlights. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I, my view of um, climate change is that it's a um, a very slow motion car crash happening in front of our eyes and, and linked with that the um, biodiversity loss and, and decline in, in, in nature. Um, so, so good people are talking about it and good, good there's some, um, you know, lots of pledges and what we need to happen is, is those pledges to materialize into, to, into, um, into, into real actions. But uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a, a system under an awful lot of um, Pressure. You know, I, can, I can go on and talk about you know, what we're doing in Chester Harbour in, in a minute, but um, in terms of hi highlights, um, you know, we, we 1.5 hadn't been lost. I think the pledges at the moment bring us to 2.4 degrees. Um, it's, it's great that um, you know, there's 85 percent of countries have signed up to um, reduce deforestation by, by, by 2030. Um, but you know, we, we need to um, see real action on the ground. And Jack, can I throw the same question to you from a, from a, from a nature based from a nature sort of side of things? Um, you know, how, what 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 was it about COP that kind of came through for you? Any any sort of key highlights, lowlights, any thoughts, perspectives? Yeah, I think it's a similar sort of tone to, to Richard there. I mean, you know, we've got um, there are you know UK wide commitments and obviously international commitments as well, and um, I think it's about focusing those. Um, you know, we've got these sort of top down approaches of kind of what's being cascaded around through the UK, but we also need to look at it in that regional kind of perspective as well. And um, and there are various different strategies that are coming through that we need to sort of um, really kind of form in the best way possible to be able to sort of facilitate things like uh, climate change mitigation and using nature based solutions. So, you know, we've got the upcoming um, uh, local nature recovery strategies, for example, and uh, biodiversity net gain. Um, we've also got the environmental land management schemes, you know, and there's all these different things that that can kind of form that that sort of uh, regional and, and, and local approach. And um, and they can all be kind of communicated across these various different regions and then create that ultimate sort of, you know, UK wide approach. And, and it's only through kind of, you know, tackling that top down but bottom up approach kind of you know at the same time can we really make you know realistic change um for 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 the climate and uh, and nature too thank you um and can i also throw that question out to the rest of the panelists so we'll start with penny um kind of any any sort of because obviously the district council i know may not be your exact remit, but obviously you have a lot to do with the environment too um nature natural environment as well so would you just kind of 
any thoughts? Um, well, I'm going to make a bit of a diversion, actually, away from Feel free. talk. And, yeah, go for it. <laughs> uh, talk about the Environment Act, which has just come out, um, and that there's uh, a new section in the Nature-Based Solution, Biodiversity, Net Gain, um, Local Nature, uh, um, I think the words are uh, nature restoration projects, which the county have just started to, uh, they'll be managing those. Uh, so you, apart from um, the nature-based solutions, we have an interest in trees. If you want to ask me later, I can talk to you about trees, but you might ask Steve about the, he knows about the other green aspects of the environment bill, more of what county's up to. Absolutely. Well, on Penny's direction, Steve, let's go to you. And then, uh, Penny, we will definitely come back for trees because trees were one of the big announcements, as Gillian said at the beginning. Steve. Have we lost Steve? In fact, finally get Royal Assent uh, last month and... Uh, sorry, Steve, I, would you I start that again? We, we seem to lose you for the beginning of that. Uh, I'm having some stability issues with the connection here. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll crack on. I'll crack on. So we're very pleased to see the Environment Act get Royal Assent last month and within that there is still a lot of detail to come and uh, there's still a lot that we're expecting to come out early next year around things like how local nature recovery strategies are going to be operated. It's uh, a new duty for probably county level uh, authorities to look across the piece to say what is it that we're doing to be able to uh, enhance uh, nature? How do we develop sort of natural solutions? How do we uh, improve biodiversity? There's a whole load of uh, uh, new initiatives coming in through around um, biodiversity net gain, which will mean that if you are developing a site for whatever purpose, you will need to ensure that either you yourself as part of that development are improving biodiversity or you are uh, in, in some way uh, paying for somebody else to do that on another bit of land. So what we will see is that land itself uh, that has the opportunity for uh, natural capital to be uh, developed will, 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 will increase in value and there will be opportunities to, uh, uh, to, to offset um, uh, the impact of some developments against improving uh, uh, natural capital in other areas. So there's a, there's a huge amount going on um, uh, on that and, and more detail to follow early in the new year. But I think it's just a reflection of the, uh, the, the sort of uh, pace that this agenda is, is accelerating uh, across the piece. I think we had something like 30 or so documents from the government uh, in the uh, weeks and months leading up to, uh, to COP26. And we've got a lot more uh, to, to, to come through early in the new year. So um, we are, sorry, I might, uh, my, my internet keeps uh, flickering at this end. So apologies for that. But um, really, we are starting to, I think, realise that we have to treat nature in a different way and we have to value it. And the one of the pieces of uh, uh, one of the responses from the government over the last few months has been to the uh, the Desgupta review, which was looking at uh, natural capital and uh, the economic value of natural capital and how we completely underestimate that and how we have historically disregarded that and used the environment as basically a you know a sink for uh, emissions and pollutants and so forth. Picking up on some of the comments that have been made in the chat, and there is a realization obviously that we can't be doing that going forward and we need to uh, find ways to, uh, to stop that and to enhance biodiversity and to ensure that development to ensure that the economy is starting to work in uh, conjunction with that and not work against it and I, I suppose just one final reflection on all of this is that, that you know that, that there is frustration about the pace uh, of change, there is frustration about uh, you know how how quickly we're able to do that. There is frustration around the fact that 
we're trying to solve problems perhaps by you know using the economic um, system that we have already but you know we have to we have to work with what we've got um, we have to sort of you know, using the analogy um, and if you prefer to, to see it this way uh, of a, a, a fair traded chocolate solid chocolate elephant how do you eat an elephant you have to eat it one spoonful at a time we have to uh, work from where we are uh, accelerate the pace of doing these things and uh, uh, you know, it, 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 we start from this point. We have to, uh, we have to uh, work from where we are going forward. Sorry, a bit of a ramble there, but um, no, fantastic, very, very, there. very interesting one indeed. Um, can I just remind participants to keep their questions as short and as succinct as possible? Because I'm struggling to read through all of the um, questions. So if you could keep them kind of to the point, that would be most appreciated. Um, Steve spoke there about. Um, a lot of a bit of, about kind of restoration um, of our natural environment. Um, and so, uh, Richard, can I go to you now and talk a bit about sort of um, what we're doing on a more of a local level um, in terms of restoration? We've obviously got the Sussex kelp forest, which is I know is not your direct patch, but then we've also got what salt marsh restoration. Um, and I believe you've got a cracking fact about eelgrass. And you're on mute, Richard. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, habitat re restoration is, is, is absolutely um, a key. In, in Chester Harbour, um, we've, we've lost 58% of the salt marsh since um, 1946. I, I picked up on Tony Edom's point there about nitrates, and they're, they're part of the problem. But uh, um, coastal squeeze is another really significant issue with sea defences um, stopping the salt marsh being able to migrate. All, all those plants are very sensitive to the amount of water that, that, that covers them. And although we've only seen 20 centimetres or so sea level rise in the, in the last century, you know, that's already having a, a really, really big impact. Um, so, so in Chester Harbour, we, we need much, much bigger effort than just individual organisations working um, on their own. So we've got together with all the major players, Natural England, the Environment Agency, RSPB, Coastal Partners and others, and have developed this initiative called the Chester Harbour Protection Recovery of Nature, Chapron, which is um, a, a really um, strategic um, plan to, to, you know, to, to really turn around that, that loss of um, salt marsh, Ta tackle coastal squeeze, tackle nitrate in inputs to really um, reduce pollutants, re restore the habitats and, and realise the benefits you know, for, for, for people and, 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 for, and, and for nature. Um, and so that's what it's really going to take, everybody working together. And one of you know, the, um, the lights at the end of the tunnel is the fact that um, private uh, finance you know, obviously sees that there's not a great deal of, of um, profit in unmitigated climate change. So I, I see money coming in for um, nature-based solutions. Um, I think um, Plymouth and Portsmouth University have recently done a study and, and decided and worked out that... Uh, the salt marsh, eelgrass beds, and oysters throughout the whole Solent um, sequester as much carbon and nitrates and phosphorus. It would cost a million, 1.1 billion pounds a year to do that by, by other, other means. So, so, you know, hugely important. And if we can restore the salt marshes, um, not only are they sequestering carbon, great for biodiversity, but also they've got the ability to rise six millimeters a year um, tra you know, trapping sediment uh, and, and carbon, which again makes it a, a superb sea defence. So the kelp restoration project's fantastic uh, in, in um, harbour areas, you know, salt marsh, seagrass bed regeneration, um, and, and then also you know, water quality, which impacts on everything else. So um, a huge amount that can be done and a huge amount being done at the moment to try and really um, turn these habitats around. Thank you very much, Richard. And I, th I think it's appropriate then to jump over to Jack, because um, obviously the Med Mary um, was featured during COP, um, as uh, one of the someone's commented in the chat. Um, so, firstly, can you just kind of maybe give us a quick run through of why the Med Mary is a bit special um, as a kind of managed retreat zone, um, and then also maybe talk about some other because you, your your regional coverage is quite significant in terms of geography. Um, are there any kind of other opportunities that we in this region or country could you know? Could, could do similar projects um, for some of the benefits that Richard was just covering? 
Yeah, no, you know, of course I can. Um, so uh, just sort of to give a quick um, uh, like overview of, of Medmury itself for those that, that aren't aware. So, I mean, Medmury is essentially the largest realignment of open coast uh, undertaken in the UK. Um, it was developed in uh, 2013 and it's a, um, <clears throat> it's an environment agency flood protection scheme that's been created in partnership with us at the RSBB and um, <clears throat> it essentially is forming vital new intertidal wildlife habitats and um, it's the the essential setup of it was to um, to help to address the impacts of things like coastal squeeze and and, and flood risk um, across the uh, the Solent um, so the Solent Maritime um, uh, special area of uh, conservation and um, and but also it provides a variety of other benefits as well. So um, at the RSPB, we now manage um, habitats such as the intertidal mudflats and salt marsh, but also farmland as well, grassland, saline lagoons, uh, freshwater pond and ditches, and also there's elements of scrub and shingle beach there as well. And all of these are providing improvements for both biodiversity, but also in turn climate change. And it is one of those sort of perfect examples of working in partnership across you know using both an environmental um, conservation organization um, alongside a statutory body um, to develop solutions to the impacts of climate change uh, flooding and coastal protection and we we do need to see more of these schemes popping up all over the UK and locally in Chichester's district and and this is the sort of thing that, that we're talking about when we're you know when we need to embed these sorts of practices and this sort of collaborative working with things like Chapron um, also with the local nature recovery strategies and, and the, the, the nature recovery network as a whole, you know, and these need to be, you know, integrated into, into local plans and policies and, um, and just providing more support and, and funding for, for, you know, a broader range of these nature-based solutions. Um, and, and that can be done via a variety of different mechanisms. You know, you can develop blended finance options for this. So, you know, you can um, use public funding and leverage off of private funding as well. So you can bring in all these different um, income streams like uh, agri-environment streams, um, schemes, woodland creation grants, uh, biodiversity net gain as well. Um, and all of these can kind of like be pulled together via the the, the uh, representative organisations on, on these sort of landscape level projects. And um, and one of the sort of the, the big things that we're, we're working on through collaborations such as um, Chapron, but also as well in, um, in what we, uh, we have amongst um, local authorities and, um, and the environment um, uh, non-governmental organisations is things like the Sussex Nature Partnership which looks at exactly this sort of thing and looking at the opportunities that might be available across um, across the county to deliver these. And we're sort of going through that process of, of generating sort of those key priority areas around the county where we can see local nature recovery strategies um, to uh, to be most effective in, in, in creating these sort of like kind of, you know, wide scale partnership opportunities for, um, uh, for nature based solutions that work for both biodiversity, but also for climate change as well. Thank you. And as you've been talking, both you and Richard, there have been quite a few comments, obviously, from people talking about development on coastal zones and that implication that has on nitrate levels. Um, I don't, I'm just going to throw it out there. I mean, but maybe maybe jump to you, Penny, because technically CDC is the planning authority. I know it's not your not your bag, as you are the kind of member for environment. Um, and Susan Taylor recently on our last conference, which was on kind of planning uh, and sewage environment, covered a lot of this. Um, so maybe those who are asking didn't attend that one, but a copy of that is on Julian's website. Um, little plug there. Um, but yeah, Penny, would you maybe just sort of talk a little bit if you have any background on kind of the nitrate neutrality policies at CDC, for example? Uh, well, technically, uh, nitrate levels are, are a planning matter, but they are very much, the consequence is very much environmental. Uh, so if you ask, do we want to, do we want to go down this route? We are Southern Water. <laughs> um, a, a brief explanation, a whistle stop tour, if you don't mind. Okay. We've got uh, time. We've got time. I didn't know how much water discussion you wanted. Um, they, uh, they will say uh, 5% of the uh, nitrates in the water is caused by humans and the rest of it is either natural or birds or animals or urban runoff. Um, but the, certainly for the, the new developments that develop into the harbour, they very much have to be nitrate neutral. And the um, Natural England have devised a quite a complicated calculation spreadsheet uh, to look at the 
state of the land before there were any houses on it and then work out how many people are arriving on that land and work out if there's going to be more or less nitrate produced uh, on that land. Um, so it, it, it is quite a, it's a quite a simple system. The, what is not clear yet, uh, if the, if the um, sorry, if the calculation puts you in a negative situation, then, then it's quite good. But if it's, um, if the land is going to be worse off in terms of nitrate levels, then you can, what is not quite finished in terms of policy is what to do with setting off or using other pieces of land. So the council is still working on that. And particularly if you've got just say, uh, one or two people going into a new building, then obviously the situation for proving nitrate neutrality, uh, the, the cost of that for the applicant is way out of all proportion um, for the net result. And in view of the fact that properties around Appledram, uh, there is a position statement which is very strict as to the amount of nitrates that can be added to that particular the rich plant. So I hope my answer wasn't too long, but um, that's basically the situation. No, thank you very much. And um, and obviously, Richard, you you probably um, you, you <laughs> this is this is becoming a bit like your bread and butter. So can I can I just ask you to kind of continue on from where Penny left off? Well, uh, yeah, um, nitrate neutral. Um, you know, has, has got has got to be a start. Obviously, we'd we'd rather not see all the houses in, in the first place. Um, just the harbour itself um, is it's slightly better off because we're a designated landscape with very little building within the A O and B. Uh, we need to safeguard the land immediately facing the harbour for salt marsh really and the land beyond that for coastal grazing so the overwintering birds have got somewhere to go at, at high tide and, and to feed the roost. Um, but, but um, yeah, it's, it's a, you know, in a very overcrowded area. It's a, a really, really complex picture. And, uh, and, and it's, it's really good that um, it is now being uh, recognized and addressed the, 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 the nitrate impact. Um, but also we still got to address the nitrates from our other sources as well, um, particularly farming. And most of the nitrates in Chester Harbour actually come from outside from the wider solar where, they're, where the levels are, are, are elevated. Um, so, you know, ch challenging in a very in a very um, populated area, and uh, and that sort of that sort of a lot of people are, are, are commenting in in the group about about sewage influx, um, which, as you say, is not necessarily the biggest contributor to uh, nitrate. You do, as the Church Harbour Conservancy, relevant uh, relatively frequent uh, water quality monitoring. Would you just sort of give us a run through of your most recent results and where you collect those 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 from? We collect them from uh, 12 sites um, around the harbour every two weeks in the summer and, and monthly in the winter. We're, we're just measuring against the um, bathing water directive, so for um, bacteria you know, associated with, with sewage. And generally speaking, the results are, are very are very good on, on that on that uh, metric. Um, uh, after very heavy rain, you know, we, we do get spikes occasionally. Um, but, but infrequently, um, I don't know what the percentage is, I don't know, 95% or so of the readings are you know, all, all past the excellent standard of the, of the bathing water directive. But you no, know, storm discharges are, are very high. Um, they're very undesirable and they bring in other elements. You don't get the opportunity to, to take out some of the other pollutants such as you know, microplastics, um, pharmaceuticals uh, and, and uh, all the other undesirable things which come past and past, past and past of it. Um, so, so yeah, in terms of bacteria, the, the harbour is um, pretty good, but uh, nitrates and uh, are are, um, are too high, and um, and we're not sure about the other pollutants, which is you know, a lot of research is going on at the moment to try and really bottom out what the, what those impacts might be. And obviously, um, there's been the recent announcement by Southern Water on their. A commitment to reduce CSOs by 80% by 2030, um, which came off the back of the Environment Bill, um, which basically means they have to by law. Um, Jack, a few people are also commenting, um, well, we've had comments saying, will the RSPB join the fight against sewage? Um, I would assume you'd probably say we already are, but I'll still ask you the question. Yeah, no, we, we already are. I mean, you know, it's of concern to us, you know, the um, uh, the effluent and the outputs um, and, the, you know, the storm surges um, that we've, we've experienced over the coast. Um, so we are, you know, 
uh, constantly trying to, um, uh, to to tackle that and, and, and trying to kind of advocate for, you know, um, a reduction in, uh, well, hopefully to try and kind of eliminate that um, that issue, you know, com- completely. And, and, th- and that comes along with um, those other kind of issues that are presented to us in terms of nutrients as well. So, so looking at like um like Richard had said about um about farming and agriculture and those sort of you know high levels of inputs and and, and trying to kind of push towards more sustainable farming as well so there's a variety of kind of different factors that are at play and um obviously nutrient neutrality will help to uh, you know neutralize that and like kind of um and like kind of you know not have those inputs um that you know uh there from like kind of the baseline but but we want to be kind of you know working more towards being also nutrient negative as well and increasing the quality of our water systems you know before um you know we've we've had these sort of you know uh these these recent readings in so so to do this we just need to look holistically uh, across that landscape and again you know this comes back to those opportunities for sustainable farming incentives through environmental land management schemes etc and, and you know with that's what we want to direct to, you know, a lot of our, our, our attention towards is making sure that, that we can kind of, you know, um, help empower those, uh, those rural communities to be able to kind of get the, the necessary um, grants to, um, to be able to deliver that and, and to have those sustainable farming practices whilst also at the same time trying to hold um, our water companies to account for the discharges that, they, um, that, that, that are occurring across, the, uh, across our waters. So much of the debate locally also was started um, following on from a Natural England report into the, into the declining um, uh, quality of the Chichester Harbour. Um, Gillian recently actually wrote to Natural England where they, where they confirmed that they will be doing another report, um, which will be published in 2023 on Pagham Harbour. Um, do you or the RSPBA have anything to do with that? Do you, what's your sort of involvement in that process? Um, that uh, I'm, I don't know too much about that. That might be something that um, uh, that, that our reserves team um, at Pagham will be more heavily involved with because um, they'll have um, a lot more uh, expert knowledge um, than I than I do, having that sort of wider um, regional sort of perspective on things. And so they're they're very much the on the ground team and have a, a huge wealth of knowledge of some of the um, the issues facing fa- facing the reserve itself. Penny, I can see you furiously nodding. Do you want to come in there? Or you, no, no, okay, you're just agreeing. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, all right, well, I think I think then we should we should probably have a quick look at some trees. Um, so, Gillian, do you want to sort of just give us a sort of um, kind of summary of what the what 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 happened to Copland trees? Just before that, I just wonder whether it's worthwhile just because um, there's a little bit in the chat as well. Just to just make sure everyone's aware of what the new pledges are under the Environment Act. Um, Please, um, you know. There's, there's often, um, I find with, with these kind of conferences, um, um, you know, there's often um, lots of people who effectively think, you know, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Everything seems so simple. But one of the things I've learned since becoming a member of parliament after nearly 30 years uh, in the corporate world is everything is much more complex than you understand how all these systems work together, how we use the systems, how we live, how we finance things. Um, but we are making qu- quite, I think, good progress under the Environment Act. Um, so obviously water companies have got to significantly reduce their sewage discharges from storm overflows as a priority. And off what's been instructed to incentivize water companies to do that as part of their forthcoming price review in 2024. So there's a pricing review every five years and off what decides how much money is going to be given back to do things like this in terms of capital or how much money you can raise the prices by to do some of these capital investments to be able to do that. So there is a system aspect there that's looked at every five years, but 2024 is the next one. Water companies have a new duty to produce statutory drainage and sewage management sewerage management plans, setting out how they will manage and develop the systems over a minimum of a 25 year planning horizon, including how storm overflows will be addressed. Now these systems are over hundred years old. So obviously there's a long-term uh, aspect as well. Um, and, but the government will also have a, a power of direction so we can actually direct those water companies whose plans are not good enough. Um, there'll also be a statutory duty on the government to produce a plan to reduce um, storm discharges, which will obviously be reported to Parliament. And a new duty on the water companies, which I think is where a lot of, a lot of this has really uh, got 
heightened in the public's uh, mind and attention because I must say I didn't really understand how all this worked until I became an MP. But a new duty on water companies to publish real time information within one hour of the operation on storm overflows. And this is like the, the Beach Boy systems and the systems that um, have been put up. And they always say transparency is actually the very, very first point to get in change, because then basically you get consumers and people saying, what are you doing? No wonder there's problems if you're sticking that stuff in the sea or into the harbour or whatever. And you get the this sort of. Um, the transparency, which puts obviously the pressure, which is which has happened actually, this has happened over the last couple of years. Um, so these duties um, will also include to monitor the water quality upstream and downstream. So there's no sort of cherry picking of where you monitor. Um, so I think the duties are important, and you know, obviously we have our MPs forum, which is a, a whole load of. MPs, I think there's 10 of us now across uh, the uh, Southern Water area. Um, the minister comes on very regularly and we, um, you know, speak to them and hold them to account about which parts of our infrastructure they are going to be upgrading next, etc. So I think it's just worthwhile taking the time to do that because there was a lot of misinformation um, a, a, a around at the time. Um, in terms of uh, trees, um, well, I mean, I think the most important thing actually is what, what I mentioned at the beginning in terms of the global picture, that 90% of the world's forests um, uh, protected by 130 uh, leaders of countries will uh, end deforestation by 2030. And, you know, in anything that you do, stopping doing the stuff that's harmful is the first thing you do. And then obviously you need to restore and bring it back as well. It's like retaining a workforce and then recruiting new people. You have to, um, you know, do that. So I think that's really important. Um, but th there's also um, some pledges about um, that we're going to plant uh, 30,000 hectares of trees every year. And we're also going to restore uh, 35,000 hectares of peatland in England uh, through the £640 million pound Nature for Climate Fund. So I think there's very, very much um, a, a focus on that and also protect 30% of the UK's land by 2030. So I think the Environment Bill, uh, the land management uh, aspect of it as well, are key uh, pillars which, which are going to bring about a change. And, and, you know, in some ways, going back to... Uh, how things used to work to some degree, you know, using natural, um, using nature to to balance uh, our use of the of the planet and 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 uh, our protection of the environment. So that's you know the money will be put behind that, and and that's the kind of focus. So yeah, there's going to be an awful lot of restoration and tree planting. Thank you, and I believe it's now Penny's time to shine to talk about the wonderful things going on in the district with trees. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, the district has been having quite a bit of fun with trees recently. So uh, we were quite lucky. So the um, DEFRA has um, a uh, started up a pilot scheme and luckily for us, uh, it's five um, councils together. One of them dropped out. <clears throat> so we were able to step in at the last the last moment. Anyway, so um, it's good to to plant thousands of new trees. So this different scheme, the biggest part of it is planting, th planting thousands of new trees. So this year uh, we've planted 11,000, we've offered for free 11,000 new trees to about a hundred organizations and various people uh, to go away and um, plant them with instructions. And then it's this kind of relatively three way scientific experiment. So this year they're free. Next year we'll do the same thing, but we'll make we'll ask people to make a, a small cost for these trees. And then the following time, they're just going to get instructions how to look after their trees. And we, we, we don't know yet whether people will just look after the trees best because they're free or because they made a small contribution towards them. But there's two other aspects to this DEFRA scheme, which is to encourage uh, farmers to plant trees near their crops and to plant hedges. So those, there's not quite so much uh, funding for that, but the couple of people in, this, in the Harbour Villages ward have taken this up and we're um, doing quite a big scheme, a uh, controlled trial to work out where, which is the best way to plant hedges and to see them survive. Uh, so that's, that's a good scheme. CDC is involved in that. And I've just um, actually was on a, a conversation with the Woodland Trust 
And you've obviously all heard about the Queen's uh, green canopy. So uh, that some of that started already, but they're doing two, a scheme in the autumn and a scheme in the spring. So hopefully, although we've just given away lots of trees, we're gonna use a different scheme and try and get some more for the people that missed out the first time around. So there are plenty of generous people who are giving away trees at the moment and all you have to do is look after them. That's lovely. And is, is the scheme still ongoing at the moment, Penny? As in, can people still apply or when will it, when, when are we expecting no, another it, tranche to open? Okay, so the DEFRA one is, obviously you have to plant the trees either side of the frost season. Um, so for this year, we're pretty much done and then we'll do the whole thing all over again next year. Uh, so collect people's names in the summers and then give them their trees in the early autumn. Uh, yeah, and then we'll hopefully, when the uh, Queen's Jubilee comes round in the summer, there'll be a bit more publicity on that because she's that's her green canopy. That's another, that's a different scheme, but also giving away lots of trees uh, from the Woodland Trust. Fantastic, thank you so much. And um, one thing I did want to pull out um, that we covered earlier, in fact, before I do that, has anyone got anything else they want to add on trees? Just signal to me if you, if you want to jump in, talk about trees anymore. Yes, Jack or Penny, both, Penny, you want to keep going? <laughs> uh, uh, the only thing that's uh, of interest is that we've had quite a few, obviously trees that are lovely big trees that are in people's gardens or in a conservation area um, are covered by TPOs. And when they get to a stage where they reach the end of their natural life, which they will do because trees don't last forever, uh, people have to apply uh, for a to have the to take the tree down and that's um obviously people don't like trees coming down so that's caused quite a bit of few emails in my inbox to keep the mature trees going and at the same time plant young ones but basically uh if the tree is causing subsidence to the property then it's difficult to keep it going that's the, that's the difficulty so the tree officer has a very difficult job to decide what to do with a tree that's not well in spite of the fact that we all love trees and that's that's what I wanted to say just about the other end of when trees get old and, and, so, uh, and yeah. similarly we've had a lot of ash die back that's been sort of plaguing plaguing the area and I know the county council have, have been quite involved in that and actually before we go to Jack Steve do you want to just maybe talk about the council response to ash die back and how we're how we're managing it yeah, absolutely. There, I mean, it has been devastating and uh, we've had to take out literally hundreds of trees to make sure the highways uh, remain safe and that um, uh, in dying and diseased trees don't actually, uh, you know, fall on the highway and cause um, obstructions that way. We are looking at our land, we're looking at our highways holdings, we're looking at other land right across the county um, to see what we can do about planting more to replace those trees, different native species and so forth. So, you know, very similar to the kind of program that Penny's outlined for CDC, we're looking at for uh, county owned land as well. Thank you. And Jack, sorry about that. You're, you're up. No, no worries at all. I think my sort of, uh, my point was just more of a uh, overall sort of reflection on 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 trees, uh, tree planting, and tree policy. I think um, uh, what what Gillian had, had said was um, was you know really 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 true in terms of safeguarding our existing woodland is is critical to to, to what we want to be doing. You know, it's about restoration and, and improvements to to what we what we already have. I mean, according to the uh, the Woodland Trust, uh, just seven percent of Britain's native woodland are currently in good ecological condition and so we need to vastly vastly improve that and uh, and and we've got 13.2 percent woodland cover across the UK's land surface so um, just seven percent of that is um, is you know it's a rather rather low percentage and um, and you know with that as well we also need to ensure that um, that what we're planting is the right tree in the right place you know uh, undertaking uh, mapping and environmental assessments um, at the site levels to make sure that we're protecting our species habitats soil carbon as well and, and, and maximizing the the benefits of these um these new trees that we're planting down and uh, 
you know, we want to just Im embed this woodland uh, expansion into, you know, our overall objectives for nature and contribute to a, a network, a, a, you know, a diverse and connected habitat. So the, you know, comments about hedgerows and, and trying to improve that, you know, we've seen drastic declines in our, um, our hedgerow uh, bird life because of, um, you know, a, a lack of, of hedgerows and, and them being kind of cut at, at, um, at, at you know, at the wrong times of year, etc. And, you know, those are the things that we need to really try Try and um, uh, try and change to um, to to really kind of create that corridor, that networking, and and really sort of you know um, embed uh, the Lawton principles of uh, of you know bigger, better, and and more connected, and um, and so yeah, so these sort of schemes to to try and kind of implement that that tree expansion through um, through community groups and uh, and different places around the district is is you know a, a welcomed proposal. Absolutely. And I think I do just want to also address the comment made by Chris in the chat about farmers ripping out hedges for larger machinery. Um, just firstly, that the hedgerows regulation of 1997 does prohibit the hed hedgerow removal. And also the farmers are generally incentivized to keep hedgerows in place because um, of existing legislation, the EU, which has been even strengthened since we've left the EU with the Agriculture Act and the Environment Act. So that's maybe just a uh, no, no, really. Um, there's also uh, quite a lot of work ongoing across our area with the um, with cluster farms, um, and they're doing a huge amount of environmental projects in the South Downs and doing things like bird restoration, wildlife restoration, and in, especially as you were just saying, Jack, to kind of identify the best places and habitats for things like particular bird species, for example, and therefore developing those hedgerows and not farming near them or, and avoiding loud machinery near them, for example. Um, one thing I did want to also raise, which is brought up by the chat earlier, was something to do with active transport. And the particularly, we got raised with the Emsworth to Chichester cycle path, which uh, uh, my, my colleagues in, Jillian's, in, in Team Keegan will, uh, will also have said have been raised before. So, Steve, could you just um, maybe, I, I, could you comment on, on the, um, the Emsworth Chichester bike path and, and kind of its current um, form and, and any work that's been done to improve it? And obviously, Chem, the Chem route. Um, as someone just put in the chat, which is the kind of the new Highways England backed scheme that would link the, the two communities. Unfortunately, I can't say too much about that, Lawrence. It's a bit outside my bag. Uh, one for my colleague, the Director of Highways and Transport, but if uh, uh, we can certainly get a, a, a written answer to that back to you, I'm afraid I can't, uh, I can't help with that one specifically. That will be fantastic. We will um, certainly put that on the web page with the recording of this session. Lawrence, it might also, because I'm not outside of Steve's remit as well, but I think something else that's also probably of interest is the sort of bus strategy, the public transport sort of uh, approach as well, um, because I think, um, you know, there is a recognition that, you know, the way that we our bus services work rurally, um, they don't really work particularly well. Um, you've got quite big buses with not many people on very infrequently going to places at the wrong times and it's it's like a a, a, a a vicious circle in a way because then when you say well why don't people use the bus well you don't use the bus because they're not going to the right place at the right time um there's hardly anybody on them therefore they're expensive and you know the routes get so we do need to have i think um a much more joined up um sort of 21st century approach you know what's the size of the buses are we going to have smaller buses hydrogen buses hydrogen uh, on demand type of services because i think i think it is an important part of the structure in a rural uh, area we talked about cars obviously uh, we'll talk about uh, cycling which is you know around those areas uh, where we could get the cycle paths but of course many of the villages um will be will rely on uh, buses and bus routes. So I think probably it's worthwhile if we don't uh, get somebody to, to follow up on it, then we can at least um, maybe maybe cover it next time if that's a timely intervention, because it is the missing piece, I think, when we talk about our sort of integrated transport and how we're going to move around. Absolutely. Um, and I know that the, CDC, the county council are also doing their, uh, are currently reviewing that strategy at the moment. Um, so just to move on to education, because climate change and the environment is one of those topics that the young 
Um, I would I, I would used to include myself maybe in that category, but probably can't anymore. Um, are, are very passionate about, and it's something that I chose to study at university, and most and a lot of other people are doing the same now. It's kind of a the hot topic, um, and I think COP proved that. Um, so Richard, you run um, some form of education programs at the um, Conservancy. How important is education in our fight of climate change? Uh, education is um, is crucial. Though everybody needs to be um, up to speed with climate change, um, to be empathetic with, with nature, and um, and often, with, as we've seen today, um, this younger generation, which are really um, encouraging you know, their parents, enlightening their parents and, and their grandparents, and really um, the ones who are the prime movers, um, you know, you know, urging action and, and really waking people up from, from their lethargy and the, the same same old way. So um, we, we run a, a classroom at, uh, at Del Key and encourage um, young children to get out in nature. So nearly all of our activities are actually in, in and around the AMB, down by the water, um, down by East Head. Um, so people, that, so they can really um, experience wildlife and really, uh, uh, really nurture the next um, generation of custodians, really. Fantastic. And, um, and and Jack, does the RSPB have a similar programme in place? Yeah, so the RSPB, obviously, we have a network of reserves and, and, and working with, you know, things like with schools and with families is so critical to, to what we need to, um, you know, deliver for, for you know, increasing um, that understanding and, and that immersion within within nature and, and understanding, you know, exactly where people are what that value has and therefore that's the only you know that's the only way that we're going to be able to empower people to be able to sort of you know fight and stand up for for climate change and and, and nature you know it's that those sort of early experiences that people have so you know that's why we've got um events that we host at our uh, reserves which is uh, you know looking at things like pond dipping and um, and like kind of you know uh, looking at all these you know different invertebrates that you might have like kind of around uh, around the reserve and, and and seeing what value that 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 you know this 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 wildlife has has to us and and it's through those sort of early connections that that we can really you know give the uh, the future generation the, the the best chance of of being able to um feel empowered to 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 be able to protect um you know what we have and and be able to safeguard um you know our, our climate and and biodiversity for the future um along with you know um every every gener other generation as well there's so many educational opportunities that that we can all have to um immerse ourselves in nature and, and have that deeper connection um for for various reasons including health and well-being as well i was going to say i mean as you're speaking um that was my, my thought was actually it's probably not the younger generation that need the education it's probably more the older generations um no disrespect to my grandparents but <laughs> um they they you know probably aren't quite with the times in, in the same way and maybe have some old habits die hard approaches um do we do does anyone on the call offer any sort of programs to to, to kind of help older people kind of um get with the program abby please abigail please I don't know anything specifically about older people, but I do know that um, when people are asked what they think about climate change, um, they are they they're actually much more ambitious than the government is at the moment, and that that isn't a criticism of the government, but I think it, the um, climate change is um, the biggest worry for people. Um, that's what the opin opinion polls are saying. And all the climate assemblies are actually coming up with much more ambitious proposals than I think the government um, are considering because because the government's concerned about um, suggesting it, things that will scare the population. But actually, I think the people are really ready to go. I think there's been a huge sea change in the last few years and um, just more and more people are interested in and want to talk about um, renewables, they want to talk about alternatives to gas boilers, they want to talk about their electric vehicles and they are, they're, they're feeling inspired and they actually want to do a difference, they can see, I mean the kids today, they're going to be middle-aged in 2050, you know it's not, it's not some hypothetical date to them, it's going to be a date that they'll, they'll be my age at and, and kids being born today they'll be they'll be 30 they're, they're, they're likely to see in the end of the century so it's it's a really it's real to them 
And I think because of that, it's real to their parents, more real to their parents and their grandparents. And I think people are, people want to make a difference now, and they want to know they want to know what to do. Hundred um, percent, and and also with the new technology like hydrogen, that's not necessarily as well understood or known about. How do we how do we kind of get people get people with that program, which which may be a bit bit bigger than than the individual, but more, maybe more businesses or, or or you know people who are operating large HGVs, for example. Why would they choose a hydrogen vehicle? Kind of how do how do we how do we make get that message across? Yeah, I think I think there's going to be there's going to be a real um, education piece for for industry. Um, and for the transport sector, um, there are there there is um, obviously people, uh, fleet managers uh, across the country are more and more aware that they need to decarbonise their fleet, and they're starting to talk to, talk to experts around that. But I think there is going to be need to be a real um, education piece. One thing that I do want to quickly mention, although I see that Penny and Jack are keen to speak as well, is that. Um, there's a coalition of Sussex FE colleges which have just received a significant amount of funding to de develop and de deliver green skills for, um, for um, students in their colleges around hydrogen, around electric vehicles, um, uh, around fuel cells, so um, smart, um, smart capability as well. So I think we need to really make sure that we do focus on upskilling the next generation to meet these issues. So Sussex is really leading the way. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Penny, can I can I come to you? Your hands up. Uh, yes, I was um, enthused by what Abigail was saying um, because the CDC has just recently had a uh, put a, a toe in the water, um, running a a free event to come along for people to learn about retrofitting uh, their own house and. Um, it was a kind of a, I wouldn't say it was an experiment, but it was our first one. And uh, we had, uh, the place was fully packed, even though we had to do it under COVID uh, circumstances. But it was really interesting people to, for um, residents and councillors to, to hear about how you do a retrofit um, and what the problems are in practical terms rather than theoretical terms and what a um, air source heat pump looks like. And nobody tells you that you, need to have a well insulated house before you install it. Um, and I just saw something in the paper today about the number of gas boilers. There's supposed to, um, the, the, the theory is that all 25 million gas boilers, uh, sorry, nobody can replace their gas boiler with a gas boiler after 2025, which is quite a scary thought considering that we're nearly in 2022 already. So people need to wise up really quickly if they can't have a replacement gas boiler and they have to have the alternative in a, just a couple of years time. So um, that was a positive experience for CDC and I hope that we'll be branching out and doing other similar things to help people on their way to um, get with the programme as Abigail set out so uh, admirably. And I, Penny, I just one of my colleagues just highlighted a comment that uh, has has made her her chuckle, which is the plant by name, plant by nature, which came up when you were talking about trees. So uh, <laughs> that's your new slogan. There you go. I did see that. So thank you, whoever put that up. I did see that. Um, yeah, sorry, Jack, to you. Yeah, I was just going to um, kind of yeah come back to the, the you know the discussion of what um, what what we're doing for for you know all, all generations and just the wider public and trying to kind of you know uh, educate people. And I think. It's one of those things that as conservation organizations, you know, uh, we're fully aware of like kind of the the impact that we can have as an organization just trying to sort of deliver information to people is um, not going to go very far. So we need to be really, really um, inventive in, in, in how we can kind of address this, this, this issue. And so, um, you know, we've come up with different sort of solutions for that. So, for example, um, we've got, you know, uh, rewild our world or, or uh, revive our world. Um, which is looking at sort of you know those little individual actions that people can take for both climate and nature you know nature on your doorstep and um, those so those little independent things that people can um, can do themselves um to, to kind of you know in their local setting in their local environment to um to to kind of help provide gains for for nature and um and climate um, but then all, on top of that you know we have to look at things more holistically as well and what we can do as communities so we also as well have you know provide um you know especially on on, on our website and through um through other sort of avenues as well provide advice to, to, to 
people on 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 how to you know create community action groups and 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 to kind of form sort of campaigns against um you know issues that they are particularly um uh, that are particularly important to those groups and you know we've uh, we've helped to sort of facilitate that across uh, across the country you know with the various things coming down to like kind of you know develop development and trying to kind of give people the tools and and empower people to be able to kind of use the right terminology and and, and understand a lot of the sort of you know the jargon that gets used um, in these sort of contexts which can be you know quite kind of, kind of complex and, and quite nuanced as well so and there's a, a, a load of different things that, that, that we can kind of do to help sort of facilitate that but I think ultimately it's all about community Community empowerment and, and making sure that people have the right tools to be able to to do those individual actions uh, and stuff on their doorstep also as well to kind of form together and, and, and advocate for change um, as a group and as a as a local representative as well and, and that's that's really really key to, to kind of being able to, to to make that you know on the ground change um, to kind of group people together and and, and and form a sort of constructive and and uh, holistic approach to, to, to tackling these issues. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jack. I'm cautious of the time. We're now approaching our last 10 minutes. Um, and I can assure you that we will be doing another one of these conferences. Um, Gillian's organized this, as Gillian said, this was the fourth one we've done. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll be doing another one uh, in 2022. Um, so just as kind of to, for the last 10 minutes, if I could just ask all the panelists to sort of give me your kind of highlight of COP or the biggest challenge and the biggest challenge you think we are facing. Um, it could be on any level as a community, it could be nationally, it could be internationally, but if you can, to put you on the spot, have just kind of one thing, and then I'm going to pass to Gillian uh, to just to close um, to close this uh, Chichester Community Conference on COP26 a month on. So, um, Abigail, can I start with you? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, so, although um, my focus is on hydrogen, I think that the real challenge for us will be... Um, decarbonising our heat. So it will be moving away from gas boilers. Um, I do think we've got slightly longer than Penny said, but I think by 2025, gas boilers will either, will have to be hydrogen ready. Um, but I don't think hydrogen is the solution. I think heat pumps are going to be the solution for the vast majority of our properties, which is what a report came out today saying that. Um, and we don't need to worry about making our homes perfectly insulated. We just need to focus on making them warm enough so that they can cope with lower temperatures. But I think it's getting that message across to people will be the key challenge, but it is feasible, it is doable, and we can do it, we have to. An optimistic note. Yeah. Um, Penny. Okay, you put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I, <laughs> I think it will be very interesting. I'm, I'm very much in favour of electric cars uh, because they obviously they don't pollute it for me at all. Like, but I think we still... Um, what you asked us to say, a pro uh, highlight a problem. Is the, the problem we've got to solve is how to generate enough electricity to charge all these cars and how to um, enable people without somewhere to charge them. Where, um, it's, it's easy if you've got something outside your house, but if you haven't, then that's the problem. And there's still a lot of, uh, what's it called, range anxiety that you're not going to get to your destination without an, enough electricity in your car. And probably more I think for us in the rural areas. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I think it's a fantastic idea. I just um, we need to uh, basically work it out um, and try and foresee problems that we don't yet know exist on uh, the electricity for all these cars. And, and uh, another factor is um, which nobody really likes to discuss is the moment we pay tax on our fuel that we buy. And uh, that goes towards repairing the road. So I'm not quite sure what scheme is going to be put in its place to, because um, when you buy electricity, obviously you don't pay road tax. We assume at the moment you don't pay road tax uh, on electricity. So I don't know if there's going to be some replacement system that's going to come along and uh, help repair the roads. An interesting point. Uh, Steve, over to you, please. Yeah, just some final reflections from me. Um, this is a this is a difficult and complex thing, as Julian said earlier. And um, the comments in the box kind of reflect some of the frustrations that we all feel 
about the pace of change and the difficulties. And if you do this on the one hand, then it causes that issue somewhere else. So how are we going to solve that issue? And then what impact does that have? And we've got to work and solve all this using the, the systems and the institutions that we have as, as a starting point moving forward. We do have to eat the, uh, the elephant one spoonful at a time, and we've all got a role to do that. I, I, if, I, I'm going to be cheeky and just as a not, I'm not a politician. I'm a, uh, I'm a, uh, I'm a public servant in a sense. But I think the uh, the important thing will be that uh, those that lead us, uh, be it pol politicians or other influencers, uh, we've got to walk the talk uh, ourselves. We've got to communicate a compelling vision about what the future will look like because these are difficult and you know unknown uh, circumstances that we find ourselves in and we're all trying to find our way forward in all of that. I would say to the politicians that they mustn't be afraid to regulate because the market, we have to work with that, but it won't solve everything and goodwill of people won't solve everything. So sometimes you do have to say no more vehicles after this date or no more gas boilers after this date. And so um, we, uh, I think politicians need to have the courage of their convictions to do that. And, I, and we're seeing uh, more of that. Uh, perhaps more is needed still, but we're seeing that. And finally, I would say um, we've got to enable the science and the technology uh, because we will need that to uh, help solve these problems. And uh, so the, the resources will need to go into that. And as somebody said uh, uh, earlier, very, very importantly, Abigail said very, very importantly earlier, we need to, we need to have the right skills uh, and capacity and training people, training our young people into these industries, uh, ready to, uh, uh, to, to ensure that they're rolled out with the sort of maximum efficiency going forward. Fantastic. So many challenges, many challenges ahead of us there. Um, Richard, can I, can I ask you to, to take the mic? Yeah, thank you. Um, in, in terms of challenges, it's obviously trying to get all these countries to come good with their commitments and actually um, turn rhetoric in, in, into reducing carbon. In, in terms of the positive, I think it's the, um, there's a, a substantial core of people who are really um, motivated to, to turn things around. And, and I see it in my work every single day, in organizations like Natural England, the Environment Agency, RSPB, and volunteers, people are, are passionate about um, the environment, passionate about climate change, and are really um, working you know, very, very hard to, to try and um, come up with ways of um, making, making things better. And I, I see, um, Good prospects in the in the in the net zero targets the country has. Um, people will have to start sort of offsetting what they can't decarbonize. So that will start really pinching in the future. So there'll be um, finances for mitigating climate change, which will help biodiversity and obviously uh, is, is really good. And also the other initiatives, you no know, biodiversity net gain is going to help nature recovery networks. And hopefully that these things will all start coming together and making a big difference in, in, in this country. And um, and obviously we need to sort of set the pace for others to, to follow really. Fantastic, thank you. And then Jack? Yeah, I think in terms of uh, the sort of the, the biggest thing that I've, I've gotten from COP26, uh, a similar sort of tone to, to Richard there in, in terms of it's, it's, it's about the people and, and you know, the communication of, of this, the interest that has been generated and that discussion, that debate, you know it's at the forefront of people's minds and we need to use that momentum to continue those conversations and make sure that we are acting on 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 those commitments and, and making that positive change and 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 with that that's where the you know the the critical difficulties lie I think is um, I mentioned it earlier about those sorts of processes and there are diff different levels to this you know we've got our we've got worldwide commitments we've got UK level commitments we've also got local commitments as well and you know it's all that's all part of creating this nature positive economy for climate you know tackling you know nature and climate emergency in unison and all of this requires a fundamental shift in our approach to, to you know economic policy making working in collaboration together and it's just fitting those pieces together at a regional level a uk-wide level and then also you know acting on it as, as a, a you know a global community as well thank you very much jack and then it just leaves uh, our mp Gillian keegan to sum up to sum up the conference for us please 
Thank you very much. Well, thank you to you, Lawrence, and thank you for chairing us and steering us through um, and uh, uh, excellent timekeeping. Uh, thank you to all the panellists for all your contributions. Thank you to, um, well, most of the comments. So some of them are a little bit political and we try not to be political here, but, uh, uh, you know, there's nothing political about climate change. Let me just uh, repeat that. Um, one of the things that's striking me about this whole conversation is actually there's a massive coherence. So there you are, you're sat in COP, you've got hundred, you know, more than a hundred countries, you're talking through, a, 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 you know, at a, at a really strategic global level, all the things that need to be done. And, uh, you know, some of the challenges that are faced um, and, you know, some of the difficulties that people have in terms of, uh, you know, making some of these changes. And yet here with this group around our area, we're actually doing a lot of the things that were talked about at that conference in practice. And I think the more we can get coherence, not just um, at a global level, but actually, um, you know, at the, at each nation as well. And the more that we get more advocates for change, uh, which I think is happening, it's happening all over the world and it's happening, um, you know, at many, many different levels. So that's a very positive thing. When it comes down to the practicalities, I was very struck when I did a project on solar in 2010, uh, which looked at why it hadn't worked in, in this country then. And it was actually the people with the skills to implement it at the time. And I was also co-chair of the Green Jobs Task Force in my old role. Um, and I was you know, lucky enough to be overseeing some of these new colleges that uh, are going to be built across the country, the Institutes of Technology, to try and tackle some of these big skills challenges. But that is something that we really do need to get right, not only to be able to implement all of this, but to be able to, we've got 1.22 million vacancies in this country today. We've got skill shortages everywhere you look. I'm now a health minister, the skill shortages in many, many different areas. So that is actually going to be one of the key challenges and I think that's one of the key challenges locally as well that we uh, you know we can we can really work together to address along with the fabulous college groups that were mentioned um, I think you know we've a huge mountain to climb um, to care of global warming um, but you know from nation state through to uh, areas like this down to us as individuals and actually there's a lot of things that we need to do differently as individuals um, and that's the bit we don't talk about uh, enough that we've mentioned a bit but the consumerization and the amount of consuming that we do uh, will definitely have to change uh, but uh, I think the, the, the quote that I'll end with was from Vanessa Nakate, uh, who's a Ugandan climate activist uh, who, who uh, was at uh, COP26. And she said, your actions matter. No action or voice is too small to make a difference. And I think that's the most important thing, because one of the conversations we were having years ago was why should we do it when we're only a tiny percentage and this country over there is doing most of the damage or those kind of why should it be us conversations. I think the good news is and with COP26, that conversation's moved on. Nobody's saying why should it be us? Why should we be doing it? Why should we be changing? Because somebody else isn't. That is actually the huge progress that was made with 90% of the countries actually committing to go net zero at a date. It may not be the date, uh, always 2050, but at a date. That's a huge progress. It's a huge start. Um, but there is no doubt there's a lot, uh, there's a huge mountain to climb. But it's been fascinating as always. And I really very much enjoyed um, the conversation and the people who were asking about the vote and questions like that on my website, you can see the answers to all of those questions. So you'll find uh, uh, any information about the complexity of the parliamentary games uh, it will be uh, explained to you in full if you are interested. Thank you very much, Gillian. And all that's left to say is thank you to you and thank you to the whole panel for lending us your Thursday evenings. Thank you to everyone who has been joining us this evening for the Chichester Community Conference. Um, just a little bit of last bit of housekeeping. This will be published on Gillian's website with um, responses to the remainder of the questions that weren't addressed as best as we can. Um, so thank you all very much and have a good evening. <laughs>